All right, great. Well, I see we still have folks trickling in, but we can go ahead and get started. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us this evening. My name is Jen Cohen. I am the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Aspen RX Health. On behalf of everybody, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us tonight. We hope you find the session to be informative and valuable. Um, the Aspen team also wants to congratulate you on this exciting time in your lives and your career. We hope that you find something interesting here with the potential opportunity for some freedom and flexibility as a pharmacist. And we'll dig into a bit about who we are, what we do, and why we do it. And uh, look forward to meeting each and every one of you and learning about your goals and how we can help you achieve them. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce our two panelists that are joining us this evening. We have Ailey, who is one of our staff pharmacists with Aspen RX Health. And we have David joining us. He is not only a pharmacist, but one of our co-founders and our CEO. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you both. Thank you, Jen. Um, absolute uh, pleasure to be here. And thank you also, as Jen said, for joining us this evening. Um, hopefully you'll leave this session today with a good understanding of what we do and excited about the future of pharmacy as excited as we are, if you will. So if we could please advance, um, I'd like to just kind of kick things off by explaining, you know, what we've built and why we have built it. So as Jen said, I am a pharmacist, um, you know, the gray hair and the, and the beard and the five head, you know, that's bigger than a forehead. Um, you know, dates myself, but, you know, we have a couple of fundamental truths in pharmacy that were true 25 years ago when I graduated pharmacy school, still true today. And that is there's never been a more important time for what a pharmacist can do to provide care to patients. We fundamentally believe that. It was true 25 years ago. It's even more so today. And why do I say that? Patients are taking more medications than they've ever taken. The average person over 65 years old is taking at least five medications every month. That's a fact. The medications are getting more complex, they're getting more expensive, and patients are struggling with keeping up with access, how they afford them, how they take them in combination. And that is the role the pharmacist plays. And so one of our fundamental truths, I would bet anyone that there's not a single part of a syllabus in any one of your classes where the curriculum includes counting by fives, putting the big bottle in the little bottle, managing angry pharmacist technicians. It just doesn't exist. Yet, unfortunately, that is the path that many pharmacists find themselves on after they graduate. And so we wanted to fix that. If we recognize that there is a great need for the role of the pharmacist in improving patient outcomes, quality of life, enhancing the lives that patients have with their families, we need to do something about it. We could be part of the problem, or we could find a solution. So that's number one. Number two for us is technology is at a point today that allows pharmacists to practice in ways never imagined. And I, I read a stat a couple of years ago from some of the best futurists in, in the world, and they had projected that by 2030, 80% of all jobs in 2030 did not exist in 2020. And so I asked, why not pharmacy? Why couldn't pharmacists reinvent the way we do work and if we know that there's all this opportunity out there, how do we create a model, a platform, if you will, that'll put the pharmacist side by side with the patient and their prescribers, truly part of the team, to just focus on how we enhance medication use and drive better outcomes. And so that was our goal, and that's what we built here at Aspen RX Health. So when we think about this, you know, the name is really important to what it is we've designed because an aspen tree cannot grow under the canopy of other trees. And so we wanted to liberate all of this talent, all of the clinical know-how that you were developing and one day will practice. We wanted to create an environment where you yourself could go into business. My brother-in-law is a podiatrist. And when he opened a practice, it was not foreign for him to hang a shingle for his practice and literally go out in the community, go to long-term care facilities, other, you know, other places where he would find his potential customer pool and market his services and ask them to trust him with his practice and for him to develop a patient base or clientele, if you will. And so we recognize that that has never existed for pharmacists. We have always practiced in a very reactive model where we graduate, we're hired into a large company, and then we sit back and we wait for work. 
And if we really want to evolve into being clinicians, we have to understand that there's a different practice that's included here, and that is building a clientele. And as somebody who's run businesses my entire career as a pharmacist, I've recognized the hardest part in growing a business is finding customers. And so that was the first place we started. We wanted to create a place for pharmacists to come, to practice on their own if they wanted to, to allow them to practice at the top of their training, the top of their license. And we wanted to assist with the hardest part of building that practice, finding new customers, patients. And so what we've done is we've built a gig economy, if you will, that allows a pharmacist to work when they want, as much as they want, and from where they want. Generally, it's the comfort and safety of your own home. It is around your work-life balance. And so some of our pharmacists who joined what we refer to as our community, they've decided this is their primary source of income. This is what they do for a living. And whether they make 100,000 a year or 110,000 a year is less important than the job satisfaction they have knowing what they're doing for their patients and they're doing it around their schedule. So that is where we started. We work with health plans to help identify who are their members, the patients, that are in need of a pharmacist to provide clinical intervention. And I'll get into what clinical intervention means. And so the 100% of the time that a pharmacist is on our platform, they are focused on right medication, right dose, right combination at the right time. And that is all they do. And so we built this recognizing that if we've created a gig economy, a platform for a bunch of independent small businesses, you as a licensed pharmacist, that can sometimes be a lonely experience. And we've learned from other gig economies just how lonely working for yourself, you know, a, a company of one could be. And so we've created a sense of community. We refer to our pharmacists as a community. And that takes a ton of effort and energy and smart people leaning into building the sense of community. That includes things like pairing new pharmacists up with mentors, uh, having a daily huddle for any pharmacist who wants to join and be part of a team, creating social media platforms where pharmacists can collaborate on patient cases, clinical cases, um, advocacy, marketing, whatever the need is, you have peers in this community who will support you. And then we provide you the necessary tools, whether it's additional training around concepts, around motivational interviewing, sharpening your clinical skills, being a better business person, even the necessary data to know whether your practice is driving in the right direction and how it compares to your peers or not, and then working with you to right-size that. That is how we've wrapped around every one of our small business owners, our pharmacists and our community to support them. So maybe we can go to the next slide. And so one of the questions that we get quite often is, so what does the practice look like? If I'm not dispensing, I'm not reacting to a prescription, what am I actually doing? And as I mentioned, we've partnered with health plans, some of the largest health plans in the country who have tens of thousands of their members, your patients potentially, that are in need of some type of medication optimization. So it could be something like a comprehensive medication review where on an annual basis, a patient who is taking 10, 12, 15 different medications needs to have a conversation with a pharmacist. Not the type of conversation that you would have at the end of the pharmacy counter, with phones ringing, a long line of people waiting on you. These are conversations that are deep and really intense about the types of medications the patient's taking, why they're taking it, when are they taking it, what questions and concerns do they have, helping them work through side effect profiles, optimizing just the number of meds they're taking and the cost of those medications. We do that for tens of thousands of patients once a year. Second, we know perhaps one of the most dangerous parts of the healthcare journey for any patient would be when they leave the hospital and they go home. About three quarters of the people who end up back in the hospital do so because of some issue they've had with a medication. They've e either doubled up on something they were taking before and a new medication after. There's a, a conflict, a drug interaction between a new medication that's been added. This is a very critical time in the patient's healthcare journey for a pharmacist to intervene. And so we may have a very intensive moment in time triggered by a transition of care like going home from the hospital. And then we provide services that are much more targeted around a certain medication. So it could be the patient has an adherence issue. It's not a reminder call. These are, these are calls focused on why is the patient deciding not to take the medication? Are they afraid of it? Do they not believe they have the condition? Are they unsure of what the side effect profiles will be and how they can manage through it? 
we coach them through those problems and it takes a pharmacist to do this work. No other clinician can do the type of work that you're being trained to do. And then we also provide more disease related training for the patient that's very patient friendly from a health literacy perspective. Again, as pharmacists, we're trained from a communication perspective to really distill things down in ways that people can understand the information we're sharing. And so we have health plans that come to us, want our pharmacists to talk to their, their patients, their members, and educate the patient about their medical conditions. So we can go to the next slide. And so before I hand off to Dr. Pesco, Ailey, as we like to call her, um, she's one of our superstars and I can't wait for her to share her story. You know, we are really proud of this community that we built for a couple of reasons. One is, as I mentioned, we have thousands of small businesses, independent pharmacists working for themselves on our platform. And because of that, we can start to think about ways that we can drive a better patient experience, leveraging the pharmacist experience. So when we can match a pharmacist to a patient that lives close to them, that speaks like them, a similar language, similar cultural background, and has a condition or a set of medications in an area that the pharmacist has invested time and money into developing advanced credentials, that creates a really incredible experience for the pharmacist. You're talking to people like you that live by you and that will benefit from your expertise. And when you can share that with the patient, profound things happen. And so that's really the method to our madness. And Ailey will talk some about that. And so when you shift that over into comparing and contrasting to more traditional models, we'll call it a retail pharmacy model, just for simplicity, you're not managing inventory. You don't have a district manager who's coming at you with quotas and prescription volume and prior authorizations. You not man you're not managing staff. You are literally your own boss. You decide when you work, how you work, what cases you take, and you get paid for that work. Now, I wanna be real about it. It's not easy. And in my entire career, Everything that was worth doing was really hard. And I relish in the hard. I tell the team at Aspen RX Health all the time, hard is good. Hard is a barrier to entry. Hard makes it all worthwhile. So this is not for everyone. We have pharmacists who try this. They think this is easy money. They just, they want to make a quick call and get off the phone and a check show up on Friday. That's not this work. This work is being a pharmacist, being a clinician, starting your own practice and when we have pharmacists who do it and do it well, they love it. And this becomes their primary primary income, if you will. Um, before I do hand to Dr. Pesco, I will just share a couple of stories with you when I talk about like just how exciting it is to see pharmacists kind of be able to be their own boss and do work that they're excited about. And so we had one pharmacist who um, was not ashamed at all. Her dream after she graduated was to have a once in a lifetime trip to Hawaii. And I learned this because she posted it on her LinkedIn page and she tagged Aspen and tagged me in her LinkedIn. And she said, Aspen RX Health is my Maui fund. So she was a full-time pharmacist at a large chain that was paying, those were paying the bills, right? And then she put a number up in her mind of what she needed to have her dream vacation in Maui. And she worked on our platform until she hit that number. And while she was in Maui, she thanked Aspen for allowing her dreams to come true. And it was because she was able to be a small business owner on our platform. The second was very recent. About six weeks ago, I received a text from a pharmacist colleague who knew quite a bit about Aspen and was floored when he received the text he did and he shared to me. So there was a pharmacist who was getting burned out working in retail and had a dream of building a test and treat practice. So testing for covid you know, strep, flu, and then in certain states, being allowed to actually treat that condition after a positive test comes back. So they wanted to create this mobile business where they could go pharmacy to pharmacy, site by site, and build a test and treat practice. But you need startup capital, you need customers to build a new practice. And so again, they put a number in their mind, they knew what the startup capital was, how much money they needed to start their practice, and they burned nights and weekends on the Aspen platform, talking to patients, solving problems, you know, really living into their dream. And then they ultimately built their own practice. And just a couple of examples that gave me goosebumps when we think about what we built at Aspen, again, liberating the pharmacist, allowing them a different career path to go and be their own professional. Now, I know many of you are graduating, super exciting time. And 
perhaps the next path, the next stop on your journey is a residency. That shouldn't be limiting, right? So you can do this work even as a resident. Uh, our hours are 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern time, seven days a week. And so if you want to make a few extra dollars, again, you want to practice at the top, uh, top of your license once you're licensed, being a resident doesn't limit you. The only thing we require is that you are a licensed pharmacist. And we are deeply passionate about that because this is an opportunity for pharmacists. We want to give pharmacists a chance to start building their own practice. So with that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Ailey. Thanks, David. Whenever you're next slide, whenever, thanks. All right, so everyone, we're gonna move forward here a little bit with one of the actually most unique features that David kind of touched on and the most intriguing feature to me when I signed up to work with Aspen. Um, and what that is, is our intelligent matching that he talked about. And this is this was really important for me as being a new grad coming off residency um, and graduating pharmacy school 2018 2019 I was really looking for an area to build my confidence and this helped me to do that so what this intelligent matching did was there's a couple different ways uh, the first way is the geographical matching and what that will do is that will actually match you as a pharmacist with a patient in the same location as you most recently Recently, we had a pharmacist who even matched with their friend's grandmother um, while making calls. Another thing with this intelligent matching is language matching. You can also get matched based on any credentials or licensures you may obtain after being a licensed pharmacist. So this is kind of a profile that you build with Aspen and you're matched with the information that we get from the health plans of the patient. And lastly, you know, as a new grad for me, I was really excited because you can be matched based on your skills that you feel most confident in. And as coming off my license and just getting ready to go practice, I was a little eager and I went and I selected all of the disease states, which I encourage everyone to do. It's kind of an opportunity where you can practice every day where you may be working with a patient that has HIV, diabetes, COPD, but when you select all these disease states, you're getting to work in an area of such broad expertise and see different things on a daily basis, putting all that knowledge that you really use to the test. But back to building my confidence and how this all kind of ties together a little bit is with this intelligent matching, it basically just finds that common ground between you and the patient. And if we know anything about that from pharmacy school is that what it does is it builds trust with our patients. And that trust is so important because we know that from trust, we can have more meaningful, powerful, and intentional conversations. So what I learned and what I kind of feared at first was having the phone and calling these patients. But with this intelligent match matching, it basically breaks down that barrier. And it made me realize that, you know, the phone was just this physical barrier. Um, and that the face-to-face -face and, and that the, 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 re sorry, the physical barrier and that anything that you do over the telephone is basically limitless. So we even had another patient um, that had searched a pharmacist that had done a review for them, found them, found their personal address and ended up sending them a Christmas card. We don't provide any of that information to our patients, um, but they went above and beyond because they had such a great experience with their pharmacist. And that's just one of the things that attracted me to Aspen. Um, and with that being said, I wanted to roll into what a couple of our other pharmacists had to say. And this kind of ties back into, you know, what David said about being having all this autonomy, you know, pharmacists are able to make their own hours and create their own schedules and set your own pace without having to meet any quotas. Um, it has allowed pharmacists to spend more time with family. It has allowed pharmacists to travel. Again, tying back the community, you know, even though you are making calls, you know, in your own home, you still have a community that supports you that on daily huddles or 
ever going knowledge that we provide. And as a new grad, for me, another thing that I was kind of nervous about was, you know, my knowledge, like while I felt confident in making the calls, it was good to have a support system of pharmacists and a community to work with while also practicing at such a high level. With that being said, you know, clinical pharmacology is also available in the app while you're making these calls. I still to this day go back and double check anytime I make a dosage recommendation or a med therapy recommendation to a patient. But knowing that that was readily available also improved my confidence coming out of school. Um, and with that being said, you know, this is the future of pharmacy, like Dr. Medvedev, David said, you know, and so are you guys. And thank you so much for being here today. And we hope you're just as excited to continue to learn about all of Aspen's future endeavors. It Ailey, thank you. That was awesome. Jen, maybe go back real quick um, before we open it up for questions here. I know a bunch have come in. Um, just quickly about the image on the screen, and sorry if I get like really mushy with some of these stories, but um, th again, another picture this pharmacist sent to us. This was a door hanger, the image that says CMR, which is shorthand for Comprehensive Medication Review. And then you could see what this pharmacist would do on a comprehensive medication review, review prescriptions, inhalers, nebulizers, yada, yada. You could see around the outside, there were a bunch of what we call Aspen hearts, and some are filled and some are not. So this pharmacist was a mom, had two young kids, was working retail, was getting burned out, missing soccer practice, taking the kids back and forth to school, and made a, a conscious decision to shift career paths and again, work for herself. And so created the store hanger, shared it with her kids and said, look, when this is hanging on my office door at home, I'm working, you cannot bother me. And the more of these hearts that get filled up, the closer I am to finishing my week and the more time we could spend together. So if the door's closed and this is hanging, you have to be quiet and don't bother me. If the door's open, I'm yours. And so this was a way that a mom with young kids, a pharmacist, a professional who wanted to practice again at the top of her license, found a way to integrate her practice into the home and make it part of the family experience. And it was just absolutely incredible. We shared it with the, the entire company. And this is the vision. This is the model. So I just wanted to touch on that before we hand it off to the Q&A. Thank you, David. And thank you, Ailey. Um, thank we you. have gotten quite a few questions in the Q&A. So David and Ailey, if you don't mind, I'm going to go through these and kind of read them out loud and we can just make it a conversation. And for anybody that's on the line where you dropped a question in or you have a question, if you want to raise your hand at any point, we can go ahead and remove you from mute so you can ask them live as well. Um, but we have quite a few here. So Couple of questions around reiterating the requirements to apply. Sure, so uh, again, um, this is today, and I'm gonna say today and for the foreseeable future, this is a platform for licensed pharmacists. We've had many questions about, will this evolve into accepting pharmacy students? But today this is licensed pharmacists. So if you're pre-licensure, you could start to begin the onboarding process, but you cannot go live until you are a licensed pharmacist. Part of the technology we have actually uses technology to go to all of the boards of pharmacy at the same time, look for your license, make sure you're licensed and in good standing and you have active credentials before we connect you with patients. That also informs some of the matching that Ailey described. So we understand where you're licensed, and if you, by state pharmacy act, if you're allowed to talk to patients in those states. So the license is fundamental to being on the platform and having access to patients. Thanks, David. And beyond the license, can you talk about any minimums or maximums as far as hours required to work? And um, would pharmacists be operating as a W-2 or 1099? Haley, do you want to take part of that and I'll fill in the gaps or do you want me to do it? It's up to you. Whatever this is so um so I'm sorry the question about the 1099 you would be a 1099 employee it would not be a W2 employee um and the first part of the question was about part full time minimum part -time hourly commitment every week. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes. Yeah, so there is no time commitment. It is open to whatever the flexibility of your schedule allows, which makes it super marketable. So if 
students can go ahead and start the onboarding process now. Can you share a little bit of insight around what that onboarding experience looks like from a time perspective and requirements? Sure. So um, onboarding uh, starts with sharing just information about who you are. So you create a profile, provide us with contact information. We do charge upfront a one-time $75 credentialing fee. That credentialing fee offsets the expenses related to doing the criminal background checks that are required for the types of contracts we do. We also, there are a number of compliance checks we have to do because many of our contracts are government related contracts. And it also covers the expenses to build your profile as it relates to all of your state licenses, your advanced credentials, and any continuing education that you are maintaining. We pay for a service to ingest that. Once you pay that $75 fee, you're now on the platform and we have a robust training system. We have a third party, you may have heard of Core Higher Ed. They work with many, many pharmacy schools to manage uh, much of the curriculum that you might have through um, different uh, auxiliary uh, programs at the college. So Core Higher Ed is a service that we provide that houses all of the content that helps educate you on how the app works, the expectations of being a pharmacist in our community, also some other skills like motivational interviewing or certain therapeutic areas that you may want to sharpen the saw, so to speak. All of that is available in the training platform. And then once you are available and able to go live, you complete a post assessment. So just show some proficiency in using the app. You then indicate that you're ready to go live and you're ready to talk to patients. Part of this training is what we call a sandbox environment, which allows you to practice in the app with an automated voice system. So you could go in and actually go through a mock comprehensive medication review or a mock uh, adherence type call. So you could practice yourself before you go live. And again, we would pair you up with the mentor, make sure you're prepared for it. We recognize that for some pharmacists, there is a, a level of anxiety before you hit the, I wanna call my first patient button. And so um, we want to support that as much as we can. A couple questions came in about um, licensed in a specific state. And if so, like in this example, uh, somebody's licensed in Indiana, another is licensed in the state of California. How does that work with eligibility to speak to patients in other states? Yes, so part of what we do is we track state pharmacy practice acts. Um, there's an old saying, if you've seen one practice act, you've seen one practice act. They're all a little bit different. And so we monitor the practice acts and our technology has mapped states that allow you to call across state lines and states that require to be licensed. And then in some instances, our clients may actually require the pharmacist to be resident and licensed. And so our technology accounts for that, and we will only present the patients in that matching logic that Ailey described to the pharmacist when they appropriately match based on location and licensure. Um, I also, one thing we didn't mention that I just want to be clear about is all of the clinical care is provided and documented through an iOS app. And so um, the patient does not use an app. The pharmacist uses an app. They log into an app. And the reason we went app is because phones and, and tablets are ubiquitous. It's always in your pocket. And as our vision continues to evolve and we find ourselves supporting different types of care transitions, the ability to reach into your lab coat, pull out your phone, document a consult and get paid in the moment is the ultimate vision. So it's app driven. The matching and patient opportunities are presented in the app you push a button in the app. You don't actually push buttons to call. You just push a single call patient button and then we call the patient for you. And everything from that point is documented in the app. And then you get paid once a week for the work you provide. How about if a consultation goes well and the pharmacist hopes to speak with a patient in the future? Are there any opportunities to deliver care to the same patient more than once? Ailey, you wanna take that? Sure. Um, so at the end of every patient call, uh, patients are presented with a survey opportunity where they're asked if they want to speak with that same pharmacist again. And that's usually the opportunity for the pharmacist to go ahead and be matched with that same pharmacist again next year. Um, to my knowledge, that might be the only way. Is there any other ways that they could speak to the same patient again? 
Yeah, so two questions after every consult, as Ailey said, we have an automated system. So you, the pharmacist, would hang up and we have an automated survey, two questions, 20 seconds. One to five stars, rate your pharmacist. So every one of our pharmacists has their own star rating, just like your Uber or Lyft driver gets rated, you would get rated. So you would know what your patients think about your consults. And then the second question is, if we ever needed to reach you again, do you want the same pharmacist as Ailey said? And that's really important to us because again, over time, what we envision is the pharmacists who are very active on the platform will build their own patient panel. And so you will no longer be out looking for new patients. You will have a thousand, 2000 patients that you'll spend all day, every day, just managing their care. And you know when you have a panel of that size, there's certainly going to be opportunities for you day in and day out to make sure they're adherent on their medications. When something new starts that you're providing the necessary review. So that's the vision for where we're going. So, yes. Questions around compensation. So how does the compensation from a gig economy um, of clinical pharmacy services compare to a full-time pharmacist position in a salaried role? As the business person, Ailey, I'll take that one. Um, Thank so you. It, um, it, it's a level of effort conversation, right? And efficiency. So compensation for us is based on completing consultations. So we only get paid when we do the work we're hired to do, and that is to optimize therapy for a patient. And so we pay the pharmacist for doing that work. So again, we find you the customer and we do what we think of as a revenue share. If you're efficient, and you you lean into this and you do it full time, um, you will make as much or more than what you are making in retail. When we think about how we pay per consult, we think about the average time a consult would make and then what you would make in alternative career paths. So if you were working retail, you might make $55 an hour. So we've calibrated how much we pay you per consultation against that. And again, if you're more efficient, you'll make more than 55 an hour. We have pharmacists who make 75 an hour. Um, if you're not, and again, some pharmacists don't care. We had a pharmacist who was making $30 an hour and I asked him why. And he said, I just love talking to people. I don't care how much I make. He was older and he's like, I just, I enjoy it. This is what I want to do. And I was like, great, you're, you're delivering great experience. So um, generally speaking, you should be able to make what you're making today albeit we do not pay benefits, we do not do 401k match, you own your business. So that is going to be up to you. And so you have to think about how you account for that. Speaking about owning your own business, there's a couple questions here about equipment. So David, you mentioned an iOS device and we have a couple questions around computers and phone. We um, do not provide our pharmacist community with devices. You will need an Apple, uh, an iPhone, or you will need an iPad um, or both. Some of our pharmacists use both, but it is dependent upon you having your own equipment. Um, and then a question came in around calling patients. And what does the caller ID show up as? Do they know that it's my personal phone? Does it show up as spam? What does it look like for the patient? Ailey, you comfortable taking that? Sure. That's a great question because we always want to make sure that the patient feels confident picking up the phone and making sure that it's a, a good call. So most of the time now we have all the caller IDs loaded so that they do say the specific health plan that we are contracted with. It does say their name when we do call the patient. So usually we'll pop up saying, you know, United Healthcare, whatever health plan that the patient is working with. So they do expect our phone calls. Great. And, and the telephone number is not your telephone number. It's an yeah. Aspen RX Health telephone number. So if the patient calls the number back or responds to the voicemail, we actually have a patient desk at Aspen RX Health that will receive the call and that can reroute it back out to the pharmacist if they're available or to a different pharmacist. So at no time, you know, very similar again to how an Uber or Lyft app might work. You can talk to your driver, but you're not really dialing their number. You're dialing a server that they have assigned you know, their numbers to, and we've done the same thing. So we have a question here around building trust with patients. So if they don't know who I am or who Aspen RX Health is, and I call them, how do we know that they're willing to talk to a pharmacist that's not connected to, say, their local pharmacy? 
Yeah, so as Ailey mentioned, the first um, barrier we knocked down is the caller ID. So first they believe their health plan is calling them and we essentially are an extension of their health plan. So they think United, as Ailey mentioned, is calling. Second, when the script, the script is dynamic in the app and we only script two parts of the console, the opening and the closing. Everything else is you practicing pharmacy. So the opening script is dynamic and you will introduce yourself as Dr. Medvedev calling on behalf of United Health. So they do not think it's Aspen Rx Health calling. They do not think it's David Medvedev, a pharmacist. They think it's Dr. Medvedev from United Health calling about a medication issue that the plan has identified. That typically disarms the conversation. We then have all of the data on the patient. We know where they live, their date of birth, all the meds they're on. So in the opening script, there's a series of questions back and forth with the patient to verify that they're the right person from a patient privacy perspective, and that we can you know, demonstrate to them that we have information on them. It's not a scam call. There's you know, still people that are skeptical, but generally speaking, this is how it works. David, I'm going to play off of your skepticism comment there. One of the questions that came in, I had two rotations with population health in two different health systems, and I want to know how you deal with patients who have gaps, for like statin, for example, and are not ready to admit that they are not adhering to their treatment plans. Do you keep calling? Do you give up? How do you handle those challenging patients? Um, Ailey, you want to take it first? I've got my answer, but I'd love for you to go first. The <laughs> okay. Here. Okay. That's a great question. So we do, we do do uh, two different kinds of calls. So we do comprehensive medication reviews with patients. And then we also do more of a targeted medication review with patients. So in the first review, you know, you may identify that gap of care that you're speaking to. Um, and then of course it's revisited three months later by doing more of a targeted medication review. And again, there are scripts in the app that you follow to do this information. But with that being said, you know, you do have so many attempts that you can do to reach the patient. And it's more of a conversation. We keep it very light um, and not accusatory of patient missing their doses, but maybe more so dig into their questions of like what motivates them or what has been hard for them and how do they manage to pick up their medications to kind of learn how they go about their everyday life of how they obtain their medications, how they take them, and then how they remember to take them. So I don't know if that ties into David, what you were going to say about it, but yeah, you nailed it. And I would just say um, whether you decide you want to you know, invest your time and energy on the Aspen Arts Health platform or not, I would encourage all of you to look into the skill of motivational interviewing. And what's important about that is when you call and tell somebody you're looking at their medication profile, they have one condition, they're not treating the other. That's your problem. That's the pharmacist's problem that they're trying to solve. They're trying to tell the patient, you need to do this for me. Motivational interviewing flips the entire conversation around. It makes it about the patient and why they should care about it. And so you get into the why for them. So whether you work for us or not, you should be thinking about motivational interviewing. That's the first one. The second is after we have that conversation with the patient, we actually capture their sentiment and ultimately, we need a prescriber to write the prescription. In this case, I think it was a statin use prescription. So we need a statin started. We actually share that sentiment with the prescriber to say, you know, hey, Dr. Cohen, we just talked to your patient, Ailey. We, we noticed that she needs a statin. She doesn't believe it. And so she's not agreeable with our recommendation. And by the way, here's the clinical reference as to why she needs it. And we will send that again on the health plan letterhead to support the recommendation. So it starts first with making it why for the patient, and second, sharing that sentiment with the prescriber to know what kind of headwind they might be entering into. Thank you both. A couple of questions left around joining the community. Um, and just a friendly reminder with our last five minutes here, if you do have a question you haven't yet asked it, please drop it in to the Q&A. Um, two questions around joining the community. So do states with provider status impact reimbursement and payment rates? Not today. So everything we're doing um, is kind of pre-authorized, if you will. So we go upstream, we go to the health plan, we understand what the health plan is trying to solve for medication optimization. 
We negotiate the rate with the health plan, and then we unlock that opportunity for our Aspen Arch Health Pharmacist. So we go around the need for provider status. That potentially may evolve. Provider status, though, unlocks a Pandora's box of other requirements then. So you will have to get credentialed. You will have to start submitting on, you know, medical billing forms with medical billing codes. There's a whole different process involved in that, that we will one day mm -hmm. we will get to, and hopefully one day soon. I mentioned I graduated 25 years ago. That was the year we were supposed to be national provider status. Um, 25 years later, I think we have a dozen states. So we'll get there one day, but we're not gonna wait for it. So today provider status in the state does not impact what you get paid. I would suggest we're generally probably paying better or at least at par with what that might look like. If you happen to live in a state um, that subscribes to provider status, like the Staten Gap, for example, can the pharmacist conducting a consultation um, meet that medication need or do they have to always default to the prescribing physician? Um, so provider status uh, doesn't necessarily mean prescribing status, right? And so even in those situations, you may need a specific contract to order incident to with the prescriber oversight. There are some limited formulary states. Provider status may allow for that in some states. But even in those instances, the plan has to be willing to accept it just because there's provider status in a state doesn't mean the pharmacist is credentialed by the plan and a recognized provider. Um, so not necessarily. Today, it's not something we can do on our platform. Great questions, though. I, I love the level of detail in these questions. There are so many questions. I, I'm in. encouraged by our future. Yes. A couple of folks have been asking about, is there a cap for how many pharmacists we allow into the community at once? And another question to just kind of parlay off of that is once they are in the community, are there any opportunities for growth? Yeah, so the cap is an interesting question because um, we have built this marketplace. And so we are constantly evaluating for what we call supply and demand. And so as you might imagine, if we had way too many pharmacists on the platform and not enough patients, it could be really tough if you're trying to make a living or earn some additional money on the platform. So we are constantly monitoring kind of supply demand curves, if you will. Uh, we actually, a couple of people on our operations team, we hired in from Lyft because those were the types of models they were running at Lyft to understand supply and demand. So that was the first question. The second question, Jen, was there a two-parter? Yes, opportunities for growth once you're in the community. Um, so again, you work for yourself, but I will tell you our shining star here with us today started in the community and now Ailey is part of our team who is on our quality assurance team, coaches pharmacists all day, every day, listens to calls, provides feedback, coaches our pharmacist up. Um, and we have a variety of different positions within the organization where people have started. We're just absolute stars. You know, we had a need to solve for within the organization. And so promoted into the company, if you will, um, through that trajectory. Thank you, David. Thank you so much to everybody for submitting all your questions. Quite honestly, we have even more, but I recognize that we're at time and it's your evening, so we want to be sensitive to that. However, um, we hope that you found the conversation to be really valuable and you've learned a bit about who we are and what we do and why we do it. If you would like to learn more, if you'd like to join the community, please feel free to visit our website and then be sure to follow us on LinkedIn. We post on there quite often about updates and we would love to stay in touch and continue to answer any questions you might have. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Be well. Bye. Bye.